If you've ever been curious about just how different the official mother novel is from the game it's based on, you should know that in this interpretation, when our protagonist Ninten first encounters Geek, his instinct is to call him a bastard and throw a grenade at him. Welcome to Dark Aspects of the Mother Novels, a complete analysis of the darker moments present in author Saori Kumi's retelling of the first two games by Shigesato Itoi. This episode will be a comprehensive overview of the first book, which does include spoilers pretty much immediately, so I recommend reading it first if you have any interest in doing so. I want to turn this comment section into a book club. In my last related video about the decades-long journey to getting these Japanese novels translated into English, I mentioned that the first story is all about Ninten, or as he's referred to in this fine piece of literature, Ken. However, he isn't exactly the main character. He's one of them as a chosen hero for sure, but in a move I think made for a more interesting read, the book actually takes place right before Anna joins Ninten slash Ken and Lloyd's party, because this story is told through the perspective of Anna who is 100% a better character than Ken here, at least in terms of attitude. This author's version of Ninten is a loud, rude, and crude kid with no patience for anything except his mission, which is to save the world, yes, but nevertheless, he's a butthead most of the time. Ken does have a couple of redeeming factors though, like his wholesome, unbreakable friendship with Lloyd. They still fight, and Ken picks on him occasionally for being a burden, but despite his low tolerance for other people's problems, he's surprisingly accommodating. Lloyd himself is a genius with technology, but laments his all-eggs-in-one-basket expertise, as it's no help in saving his mother, who's dying from an illness that can supposedly only be treated with the incredibly rare cannon flower, which is amusingly not canon in the game. Curing his mom is a major reason why he's joined forces with Ken and Anna as an ally of justice, a member of what they've dubbed the Global Defense Force, with the ultimate goal of saving their planet from a certain universal cosmic destroyer. While the Famicom slash NES Ninten and Anna were clearly interested in each other romantically, that really isn't the case with Ken and Anna. Since we do get a lot of internal monologue from Anna in the book, we see that she despises him in a lot of ways, but does, while well, she'd never admit it out loud, have several moments where she's crushing on the kid. As I was reading each chapter and getting closer to the end of the book, I kept wondering to myself what the author's version of the game's intimate dance scene could even be, assuming Kumi decided to reference it at all. These characters are friends, but they still don't really get along all that well towards the end of their adventure so I just couldn't picture it. But of course, Kumi found an interesting workaround, in the vein of Mother 2's Moonside and Mother 3's Tane Tane Island. That's right, Mother 1 now gets its own hallucinogenic sequence outside of Magicant, involving the consumption of holy water in a limestone cavern. Utterly alluring Anna with some unseen power, the reportedly 500 feet deep pool of crystal clear water calls out to her, drawing the girl in with an irresistible force until she can't fight back. It convinces her that she wouldn't mind drifting forever and ever into eternity within its serene depths, a pure blue that happens to be the same color as Ken's eyes. The lake water is supposed to be freezing cold, and is known to have sent a good number of divers to their doom, but when Anna touches it, the refreshing sensation is so vivid that her own body and heart feel lukewarm and tainted in comparison. She then clumsily scoops up the beautiful blue with her hands and brings it to her lips, sipping the delicious, cell-changing, sensory overload water that tastes like moonlight. When Ken is convinced to drink it for himself, the two stare into each other's eyes, and an intense passion they think is love overtakes them in that moment. They become so absorbed in each other's love, in fact, that they don't even notice the war zone of gunfire that surrounds them. Their new psychic shield keeps them completely safe to indulge in this newfound bliss, which the robots catch on to and, as a result, proceed to target the only vulnerable hero left, Hurricane Joe, aka Teddy from the original, who's described here as a bear-like man donning two bandoliers in the shape of an X, with a carbine gun slung over his shoulder while wielding a machete. He can down eight beers no problem, and slap away an entire motorcycle with his bare open hand without twitching. When Ken and Anna finally come to from their trance, they suddenly realize what had taken place around them with a whiff of the copious amount of blood, and Joe's severely injured body collapsed onto the floor, with no memory of their special moment together. I think this was a brilliant equivalent to the game's events, where Teddy is gravely wounded in an unwinnable encounter. Before that life-threatening ordeal, Nintendo and Anna legitimately confess their feelings for each other without drinking a mind-altering substance. 
then dance with one another, similar to Ken and Anna here enveloping themselves to be as close as possible inside of an invincible bubble. If that description of what happened to Joe was any indication, the battles in this book are much more descriptively violent than their in-game counterparts. This makes sense, as while nothing overly gruesome is ever shown on screen in Mother, some of the implications of the turn-based fights, like Ninten using a baseball bat to beat possessed zoo animals, suggest some pretty intense battle scenarios. The novel trio's first fisticuffs is described as early as Chapter 2, when Ken, Lloyd, and Anna are circled by four giant voracious white wolves with breath that smells of blood. Their teeth are as sharp as knives, and behind the rows of those ferocious fangs are rolling, twitching tongues tinged with black. Unlike the game, we're told explicitly what kind of a blow Ken lands with his bat, an explosive three-base hit to the muzzle he reportedly takes great pride in. Right before the wolves retreat into the depths of the forest, they collapse in the snow as their legs begin to convulse, while the evil possession seems to drain from their faces. That's nothing compared to the next ambush, though, involving hordes upon hordes of seemingly endless bloodthirsty mice, summoned by what Anna thought was a friendly one. Countless mice with pointed teeth ready to tear the three of them to shreds form into a tall, fuzzy mass leveled to the top of Lloyd's head, and spread wide to cover every square inch of the floor, like some awful mousy carpeting. They gnaw and thrash around, targeting any exposed skin they can sink their teeth into, a ghastly predicament straight out of a nightmare. Anna is blinded from a series of tail whips and starts to lose consciousness because of the sheer quantity of rodents overwhelming her. And when she falls to the ground, she hears the pitiful little chirps of mice who are now pinned underneath her. Ken does end up rescuing her, but it's now time to talk about the character I, and English fan translator Niasu Nekoban, think is the best in the novel, Lloyd. It is Lloyd who first shows kindness towards Anna and even makes a move on her about 20 pages in by giving what Anna describes as a terribly brief kiss on her hand. Fun fact, this excerpt was the first of Kenny Sue's translations he and Mado decided to post on Earthbound Central, which actually inadvertently soured some fans on reading it, because they thought the entire book was just going to be some cheap, mushy teen romance novel. The comment section here is pretty funny. Of course, romance is not the main focus of this adventure at all, but I did want to talk about one of my favorite related moments involving Lloyd, when he agrees to marry off Ken, without Ken's permission, mind you, to the owner of the Rosemary Mansion's daughter for his blessing to enter the property. The funniest thing about this, besides Ken absolutely exploding in anger when he finds out, is the fact that his apparent future father-in-law supports and encourages his daughter's desire to be wed to this boy, having only just met him, and despite his complete lack of decency. Wolfing down food at a fancy feast offered by Mr. Rosewater, Ken lets out an enormously offensive belch after their host opens his heart to talk about the purity and happiness he wishes for his daughter. Everyone in the room falls dead silent, but the man continues on by feigning ignorance. This genuinely got a laugh out of me. Progressing chronologically from here, the hero's search for eight magical melodies takes them to the Yucca Desert, rumored to have been the site of a battle fought long ago between countries. It's an area haunted by the spirits of those who died in this conflict, with an impressive negative 103 skull and crossbones tourist rating. A dizzy from the heart Lloyd's eyes rolling in the back of his head, turning a sickly pale blue, then passing out lifelessly in the sand after rambling on about copyrighted brand names, which started with Ken mentioning an oasis, is hilarious. Later, when a formation of UFOs is spotted overhead, the lot of them duck down into the shadows of the sand dunes. However, Lloyd is still delirious and wants to see the flying saucers, so he crawls on all fours to get a better view, but is greeted by a scorpion instead. Anna uses her ability to telepathically communicate with creatures to calm it down, but unfortunately, as soon as Thoid safely backs away, Ken sends the no longer threatening Scorpion's helpless, tiny red body flying into the distance. My own grandmother doesn't have psychic powers to lull Scorpions out of stinging or anything like that, but she does live in Arizona, like me, and has had to land several smash attacks on hostile Scorpions that have invaded her home. One of them even snuck its way inside the pages of a book she was reading. Seriously. I just wanted to tell that story as this is a legitimate trope about the desert, but so is the wonderful stargazing out here, so don't hesitate to visit. Because Ken smacked an innocent scorpion with his bat, he and Anna yell at each other about how an ally of justice should be acting, and then she starts praying for him, which is amazing. The old man of the desert considers himself a gravekeeper of sorts, since so many of the men who were once under his command are now at rest beneath the sand. 
That's why he's never been able to bring himself to leave. He also owns a creepy blood-sucking plant with petals in the shape of lips that ask to be fed, stored away in a greenhouse along with a singing cactus fans of the game might recognize. Or so he thinks, but it looks like the thing sprouted legs and ran away. But not to worry, there are more singing cacti in the ruins occupied by monkeys, hidden deep within the desert. These ruins seem far more dangerous to navigate than they were in-game, as Anna accidentally activates a death trap that makes the earth around her tremble and the architecture crumble, causing some of the monkeys to either fall off of or be crushed by falling pieces of the ruined walls. Huge fissures crack open beneath her and the boy's feet, revealing wide, deep chasms that would certainly bring them to their demise if they fell in. All of this madness eventually leads the heroes through a portal to Magicant, a world which curiously makes Anna feel a bit of blackness in her heart, as an innate rejection of the nauseating pink atmosphere and the boys' over-enthusiasm in being here. To be fair, it isn't their fault. They seem to be entranced, as if they're love-struck, stuck in a dreamy, thoughtless, too happy state that sickens Anna. My favorite description of them in Magicant is as follows. Those overly familiar girls were very insistent as they led Ken steadily onward, tugging at his hands. Lloyd called after them in a very nasal voice, saying something like, Aw, wait for me! And then, like a butterfly charmed by nectar, he fluttered off to join them. Her black-tainted heart in this strange place also comes from a place of concern and anxiety. As they enter Queen Mary's castle, the distance between her and the boys never seem to close in, despite her quickened pace, as she catches fleeting glimpses of them from behind, whenever they all turn a corner. She then has a twisted vision of them not remembering Anna's name, with their eyes turning a hazy, sugary shade of pink to match this blushing dreamland. The soldiers of the Queen's throne room are intimidating, as they wield spears adorned with cords colored wine red, giving them the dreadful appearance of having just finished stabbing someone to death. Anna speaking up against the queen, whisking them away to her fantasy to indulge while the real world is suffering, even in fear of being executed, is a great character moment for her. Queen Mary is fortunately not malicious, but does admit to doting over her children a bit too much. She brought them here for that selfish reason, but also to give them gifts, blessed with attributes best suited for the intended recipient, similar to Father Christmas of Narnia and his presents, while also successfully conveying that feeling of earning endgame equipment in an RPG. Each armor piece is bestowed with a magical ability. Ken's new baseball hat brings him strength as a leader by encouraging those with righteous hearts to follow him without hesitation. Lloyd's snazzy pair of glasses help boost his mental acuity like a wisdom capsule, and a glittering heart-shaped necklace for Anna has comparatively vague powers of love, truth, and hope that channels her natural ability to awaken boys from their delusions and turn them into real men, or something like that. Now that the heroes are geared up, but before moving on from Queen Mary's domain, I want to highlight a notable quote, suggesting that her dreamy country never truly vanishes when her completed song is sung, unlike what happens in the game. This is a place that anyone may call home, as it remains in the depths of one's subconscious for all of eternity. Taking off their figurative rose-tinted goggles, lands the Warriors of Justice in Youngtown, where all the adults have been puzzlingly abducted and taken to Mountie Toy. This was also the place Anna's own mother went missing, when she had to travel here on business for the church. With all these lost children yet no one to supervise them, an orphan named Amy seized the opportunity to take control. Apparently, there were a good number of kids who mistakenly thought that they could become the boss here, but they've all been sorted out by being knocked out with Amy's right hand punch. This society without grown-ups is where the gang also meets Noelle, the psychokinetic-powered baby with abilities that surpass even Anna, who senses and can teleport the party to the next melody, located in the notoriously dangerous LA. Famous for drugs, violence, and crime. An amazing void moment in this chapter is the boy leisurely strolling towards a group of violent bikers, with Joe, aka Teddy if you've forgotten, as their leader, to fix his motorcycle for him, since this version of Lloyd's backstory involves a history of illegally copying and modding electronic bike software for money, so he's had plenty of experience. In this town that good little children are forbidden to visit, Anna spots a lone, dainty-looking gold-colored shoe by a bush. When she picks it up to get a closer look, she hears giggling from beyond the brush, and sees two or three pairs of bare legs, which makes her turn red all the way up to her ears. When the kids finally find a seemingly normal adult they can actually speak with, an elderly woman feeding animals in the park, she jumps and runs at the sight of them. 
There's also another pair of wild women waiting in the huge line gathered at the live house. One is practically naked, while the other walks around kissing anyone she can find. What I find to be truly funny, though, is that before the gang winds up being conned by purchasing fake passes, this book, based on a Nintendo game, blatantly tells us what the definition of a scalper is, as if we Nintendo fans aren't already well aware. To be fair, this was written in 1989, so I guess Kumi couldn't predict the sorry state of Amiibo, and any other limited edition Nintendo merchandise to come. Ken, Anna, and Floyd need tickets to the live show, because that's where they think they'll hear the next melody, alongside some no doubt sinful degenerate rock and roll music. Thankfully, despite being duped by a fraudulent ticket seller, Lloyd now knows a guy, that guy being Joe, the main performer everyone's apparently lining up to see. Now backstage, Lloyd quickly narrows in on the aforementioned cannon flower imperative to his personal mission at Joe's gift table, and secures it in spite of an ineffectual display of begging. In a panic to rush home to Marysville for the first time since the boy's initial departure, Anna mistakenly wakes up an already groggy Noel, who accidentally expends even more of his energy than necessary by teleporting everyone in the room, band members included, to Lloyd's hometown. Because Noel's powers are dependent on how well fed and rested he is, this happening towards the end of the story was a great way to ensure that they all can't just warp to Mount Toy for the final battle. Their fastest method of transportation is going to be dead asleep for a long while. So a group of them plan to make the arduous trip up the mountain themselves, aided by one of the Rockstar's SUVs. While in this ironically named town, both Ken and Lloyd learn that their mothers, along with every other mother, have been taken from their homes in Podunk and Marysville respectively by spaceships. Unlike Youngtown though, the rest of the adults were left behind, so they all banded together and agreed to wage war against the aliens, jointly pooling whatever they could use as weapons, then heading off to storm Mount Toy. The only ones holding down the fort, so to speak, are self-described useless old men like Lloyd's neighbor and Ken's younger twin sisters who've been living in fear this entire time. Bawling in desperation with the special cannon flower in hand, Lloyd finds his house completely vacant and freaks out by presuming his mother's already passed. But he is ultimately able to coax himself out of a panic attack and calm down, by planting the flower safely in their backyard garden with hope in his heart that she'll make it home okay. Anna was the only one in their group who saw this coming, and not through some premonition. She noticed that the huge fleet of saucers they all spotted back in the desert were flying in the direction of Marysville, but she didn't say anything to the boys in fear of deflating their will to soldier on. Lloyd's elderly neighbor Sam fills them all in on the remaining adults' rescue plan, despite it being doomed to fail because of Geeg's near impenetrable psychic barrier. He notes the strange nature of Earth's animals and humans being hypnotized at random, along with all the mothers here specifically having been kidnapped, as if the enemy is desperately searching for something. Sam is closer than he probably realizes in solving this mystery, as Geeg is searching for something, or more specifically, someone, his own mom. In the original game, Geeg stored his human prisoners inside of test tubes within a cave near Mount Toy's summit, which had disconcerting implications for sure, but the descriptions of the brainwashed adults held captive at the mountain base in this book are far more disconcerting. Anna sees firsthand a huge crowd of possessed, injured-looking adults, covered in dirt, grease, grime, and sweat. She can hardly tell the difference between them all, as they've chaotically piled up on top of each other like one single living mass, with what may be corpses mixed in. Among the horde are friends of Anna's family, including Lily's mom, Natalie, a churchgoer who's now under Geeg's spell, mistaking Anna for her own daughter, like every other mother here desperately clinging on to the hapless girl with their filthy hands. The zombie-like adults seemingly begin fighting over her by pulling hair, scratching, biting, and landing bloody blows on one another. They've just about completely lost their minds. An overwhelmed Anna discharges a psi blast that sends anyone within a 20-foot radius around her flying, and is shocked to see that she inadvertently inflicted irreparable damage to fellow humans. We get a horrific account of what this feels like from Anna herself, as a second bout of that explosive energy is suppressed and redirected a course throughout her body. All of her blood seemed to boil, her bones seemed to grate against one another, and every one of her organs felt as though they'd been turned into minced meat from some kind of terrible shock. And all of this pain echoed five or six times stronger. Her entire body became numb, as though it wasn't even her own anymore. 
Thinking she deserves to be punished for having sinfully used this great power, Anna welcomes the pain and endures the suffering until it stops, which turns her hair, she offered up to God earlier in prayer as a sacrifice, Snow White. All this commotion is what causes Geeg to finally reveal himself. Housed in glass underneath his mothership are more adults, mindlessly calling out for their precious Geeg. It seems that without a mother to call his own, the alien threat has tried to fill the void by forcing all of Earth's mothers to love him instead. That was never going to replace the real thing, however, so with a time machine known as the ultimate reset button in his possession, Geeg's endgame is to send every single thing on Earth back to a state like being in a mother's womb all over again. The only thing our little heroes have on their side to match the might of his malevolence is the robot Eve, who was notably modeled after Lloyd's mom in the book because she was built by Dr. Distorto, a generic enemy type from the game made into a single character here, that character being Lloyd's dad. Distorto is a cruel nickname given to Lloyd's father by Geek, whose army disfigured the man for feigning loyalty. Lloyd's papa explains that like an insect, Geeg must retreat into a cocoon made out of his own body fluids at intervals during the course of his growth. Observing Geeg's hibernation habits is how he managed to escape from the mothership, but he didn't flee unscathed as an Omega Saucer brutally shot him down. The incident left him with facial scars, deformed legs, and the total loss of his right hand. The man became estranged from Lloyd to try and revive his mortally sick wife. Lloyd's mom, the real Eve, while pretending to join Geeg to restore his creation, the robot Eve, who swears in this book, which is unrelated but really funny to me. Honoring the tradition of not so great fathers in the Mother series, Distorto even felt contempt towards his son this whole time, because he always saw Lloyd as a coward with no willpower, so Lloyd feels understandably indifferent about whether or not they'll meet again. Getting back to Lloyd's artificial mother, Eve directly challenges the cosmic invader in combat, but this titan's courage is tragically met with a body-piercing laser that brings her to ruin. It's certainly not all for nothing though, as from within the wreckage, a final melody begins to play. Adding far more elaboration than what was provided in the game, Geeg's birth mother is actually a major character in this story, and she was good friends with Nintendo's great-grandparents having presumably abducted his great-grandfather George and great-grandmother Maria as samples for some kind of experimentation, she was surprised to find a species of lesser psi on the remote planet Earth, and became more interested in learning about them as people. Geeg's mother and Maria soon formed a deep connection and friendship with one another, because they were both expecting and felt comfort in the idea of being mothers together. This was not meant to be though, as some urgent incoming disaster, translator Niasu decided to specify as being a comet, was heading towards Earth at the same time Maria started having contractions. Knowing it was the only way to save them, the alien mother used self-destructive psi to stop the comet, sacrificing herself for the future of Maria's child. In return, Maria promised to incubate Geeg's egg and raise him like her own but the baby's scheduled to hatch in about 150 human years, so Maria has to use a type of time capsule that runs on psi power aboard the mothership to watch over the egg until he's born. Maria decided to stay on the ship and enter the time capsule, while George brought their own newborn baby back home on Earth, and started researching the secrets of Psy, in preparation for the inevitable day more visitors like Geek will come again, in hopes that he can reunite with his wife one day. For the rest of George's lifetime, however, no other extraterrestrials presented themselves, and Psy remained an unsolvable enigma. Maria's plan didn't quite work either, due to the time capsule either being incompatible with humans, or the Earth's ever-changing climate. The strong Psy field on Geek's ship eventually caused Maria to be reborn as Queen Mary, who created the sickly sweet realm of Magicant as a sort of baby's nursery. But Geek hatched into our world and Queen Mary had no recollection of her time as Maria, so there was no one to watch over him, with a certain fractured nostalgic song keeping the two separated. Singing the restored eight melodies is the only way for Queen Mary to regain her memories of being human, which eventually allows her to re-establish a connection with the life form she loves so dearly, as they embrace and fly away in the starship to wherever Geek's birth mother is. Geek and Maria's conclusion was satisfyingly heartrending. But this is Dark Aspects, so we must undo that pretty bow because sadly I'm not leaving things wrapped up so nicely. My final talking point for today then, is perhaps the weirdest thing I've ever had to talk about on the channel, which the author also saved for last so don't blame me. 
That is to say, the closing few sentences of the novel. I want you to read these along with me, and think about how it all sounds without context. Anna nodded with powerful enthusiasm, while subconsciously, she gently stroked her lower belly. And somehow, her smile was not unlike that of Queen Mary. At the foot of the mountain, even the cherry blossoms were already blooming. Alright, I have three explanations for this. Firstly, and this is how I interpreted the meaning, is that this is purely symbolic. Throughout the novel, there's an underlying theme of Anna realizing just how amazing mothers are, and that she'd likely make for a wonderful parent one day. It's mentioned several times that she possesses an innate motherly instinct, and is described as being exactly alike Queen Mary, said to be the essence of all mothers combined in some ways. I think it'd make some sense for Anna to be rubbing the area around her navel, that's how it's directly worded in Japanese, as an odd way of foreshadowing her future destiny as a mother, while she's subconsciously thinking of what just happened with Maria and Gig finally being at peace. The second explanation is the obvious, albeit upsetting one, where the line is taken literally. While we're never outright told anything obscene like that happened in the story, there was that hallucinogenic sequence with the cavern water, and would, if something unmentionable happened we weren't told about, unfortunately imply that Ken is the father. It's worth noting that in a previous chapter, there was focus on Lloyd and Anna being mistaken for a couple, while they were both picking up supplies at a supermarket while carrying Noel. A stranger tells them, Good for you, youngins. Go on, go on, keep at it. Romeo and Juliet were in their early teens too, you know, and we can't lose to the Europeans. This reaction inspired Lloyd to start talking about certain passionate feelings of love, as well as the intense urges particular to puberty. Note that this was the censored line by Nyasu. Lloyd says intense sexual urges specifically in the original Japanese version. Anna is flustered by their conversation, and confides in Ken about it, who in turn gets embarrassed and turns red. This causes Anna to feel relieved, but also curiously lonely and disappointed. So she then responds with a deliberately wanton air, which is suspicious behavior for a 12-year-old girl. She was corrupted by that rock and roll music, I tell ya. If this wasn't Kumi's intention, and I hope it wasn't, I'm just going to pretend that Queen Mary gifted Anna a child in the spirit of the Virgin Mary. Rest assured, if Nyasu is ever given the opportunity to meet the author, she will ask, what did you mean by that please? With all that said, I hope I didn't just discourage you from reading or enjoying the book, because my thoughts about it are overall very positive. I had an absolute blast reading Saori Kumi's Mother, and I do recommend her story as a compliment to the original. So does Shigesato Itoi, as it's presented by him. I personally love the descriptions of Sai, like Anna first realizing her offensive powers by acting as a lightning rod to the vast, untamed, powerful flow of energy circling the universe, collecting it. I'm also a big fan of all the little moments Kumi wrote in that successfully feel very mother-like, such as the characters breaking the fourth wall a bit by critiquing Ken as he's describing Magicant, asking why he suddenly changed genres from sci-fi to fantasy. Then there's the subtle ways in which Kumi referenced the games, such as Geek's inexplicable attack being a flash of something like red lightning, which somehow creates a pain in the kids' throats, while thinning the air around them as an attempt to stop their singing. Next time, I'm going to be diving into the arguably superior sequel novel, which is guaranteed to baffle any Earthbound fan. Everyone's favorite next door neighbor, Pokey Minch, for example, drives his dad's Ferrari and disturbingly becomes a host for Gigas, which I'll leave at that for now. If you like this video, I do encourage you to leave a comment. And if you just can't wait until that next episode, please consider joining my Patreon for early access and updates. Thank you all for watching, see you all for part two.